Okay, let's read chapter four of The Breadwinner. It was very late by the time Parvana and her mother returned home from the prison. Parvana was so tired she had to lean against mother to make it up the stairs, the way father used to lean against her. She had stopped thinking of anything but the pain that seemed to be in every part of her body from the top of her head to the very bottom of her feet. Her feet burned and stung with every step. When she took off her sandals, she could see why. Her feet, unused to walking such long distance, were covered with blisters. Most of the blisters had broken and her feet were bloody and raw. Norian and Miriam's eyes widened when they saw the mess of Parvana's feet. They grew wider still when they saw their mother's feet. They were even more torn up and bloody than Parvana's. Parvana realized that mother hadn't been out of the house since the Taliban had taken over Kabul a year and a half before. She could have gone out. She had a burqa and father would have gone with her anytime she wanted. Many husbands were happy to make their wives stay home, but not father. Father, you are a writer. He Fatana, you are a writer, he often said. You must come out into the city and see what is happening. Otherwise, you will not know how to write about it. What would I read? What, what, who would read what I write? Am I allowed to publish? No. Then what is the point of writing? And what is the point of looking? Besides, it will not be for long. The Afghan people are smart and strong. They will kick these Taliban out. When that happens, when we have a decent government in Afghanistan, then I will go out again. Until then, I will stay here. It takes work to make a decent government, father said. You are a writer. You must do your work. If we had left Afghanistan, we had the chance. I could be doing my work. We are Afghans, he said. This is our home. If all the educated people leave, who will rebuild the country? It was an argument Parvana's parents had often. When the whole family lived in one room, there were no secrets. Mother's feet were so bad from the long walk that she could barely make it into the room. Parvana had been so preoccupied with her own pain and exhaustion, she hadn't given any thought to what her mother had been going through. Noria tried to help, but Mother just waved her away. She threw her burka down on the floor. Her face was stained with tears and sweat. She collapsed onto the toe shack where Father had taken his nap just yesterday. Mother cried for a long, long time. Noria sponged off the part of her face that wasn't buried in the pillow. She washed the dust from the wounds in her mother's feet. Mother acted as if Noria wasn't there at all. Finally, Noria spread a light blanket over her. It was a long time before the sobs stopped and Mother fell asleep. While Noria tried to look after her mother, Miriam looked after Parvana. Biting her tongue in concentration, she carried a basin of water over to where Parvana was sitting. She didn't spill a drop. She wiped Parvana's face with a cloth she wasn't quite able to wring out. Drips from the cloth ran down Parvana's cheek, Parvana's neck. The water felt good. She soaked her feet in the basin and that felt good too. She sat with her feet in the basin while Noria got supper. They wouldn't tell us anything about father, Parvana told her sister. What are we going to do? How are we going to find him? Noria started to say something, but Parvana didn't catch what it was. She began to feel heavy. Her eyes started to close, and the next thing she knew, it was morning. Parvana could hear the morning meal being prepared. I should get up and help, she thought, but she couldn't bring herself to move. All night long, she had drifted in and out of dreams about the soldiers. They were screaming at her and hitting her. In her dream, she shouted at them to release her father. But no sound came from her lips. She had even shouted, I am Malali, I am Malali, but the soldiers paid no attention. The worst part of her dream was seeing mother beaten. It was as if Parvana was watching it happen from far, far away and couldn't get her to help, couldn't get to help to her to help her up. Parvana, Parvana suddenly sat up, then relaxed again when she saw her mother on the toshak on the other side of the room. It was all right. Mother was here. I'll help you to the washroom, Noria offered. I don't need any help, Parvana said. However, when she tried to stand, the pain in her feet was very bad. It was easier to accept Noria's offer and lean on her across the room to the washroom. Everybody leans on everybody in this family, Parvana said. Is that right, Nori asked, and who do I lean on? That was such a Noria-like comment that Parvana immediately felt a bit better. Noria being grumpy meant things were getting back to normal. She felt better still after she'd washed her face and tidied her hair. There was cold rice and hot tea waiting when she had finished. Mother, would you like some breakfast? Noria gently shook her mother. Mother moaned a little and shrugged Noria away. Except for trips to the washroom and a couple of cups of tea, which Noria kept in a thermos by the tow shack, mother spent the day lying down. She kept her face to the wall and didn't speak to any of them. The next day, Parvana was tired of sleeping. Her feet were still sore, but she played with Ali and Miriam. The little ones, especially Ali, couldn't understand why mother wasn't paying attention to them. Mother's sleeping, Parvana kept saying. When will she wake up? Miriam asked. Parvana didn't answer. Ali kept waddling over to the door and pointing up at it. I think he's asking where father is, Noria said. Come on, Ali, let's find your ball. Parvana remembered the pieces of photograph and got them out. Her father's face was like a jigsaw puzzle. She spread the pieces out on the mat in front of her. Miriam joined her and helped her put them in order. One piece was missing. All of father's face was there except for part of his chin. When we get, when we get some tape, we'll tape it together, Parvana said. Miriam nodded. She gathered up the little pieces into a tidy pile, 
tiny, tidy pile and handed them to Farvana. Farvana tucked them away into a corner of the cupboard. The third day barely creeped along. Farvana even considered doing some housework just to pass the time, but she was worried she might disturb her mother. At one point, all four children sat against the wall and watched their mother sleep. She has to get up soon, Noria said. She can't just lie there forever, Parvana replied. Parvana was tired of sitting. She had lived in that room for a year and a half, but there had always been chores to do and trips to the market with father. Mother was still in the same place. They were taking care not to disturb her. All the same, Parvana thought if she had to spend much more time whispering and keeping the young ones quiet, she would scream. It would help if she could read, but the only books they had were father's secret books. She didn't dare take them out of the hiding place. What if the Taliban burst in on them again? They'd take the books and maybe punish the whole family for having them. Parvana, Parvana noticed a change in Ali. Is he sick? She asked Noria. He missed his mother. Ali sat in Noria's lap. He didn't crawl around anymore when he was put on the floor. He spent most of his time curled in a ball with his thumb in his mouth. He didn't even cry much anymore. It was nice to have a break from the noise, but Parvana didn't like to see him like this. The room began to smell too. We have to save water, Noria said, so washing and cleaning didn't get done. Ali's dirty diapers were piled in a heap in the washroom. The little window didn't open very far. No breeze could get into the room to blow the stink away. On the fourth day, the food ran out. We're out of food, Noria told Parvana. Don't tell me, tell mother. She's the grown up. She has to get us some. I don't want to bother her. Then I'll tell her. Parvana went over to mother's toe shack and gently shook her. We're out of food. There was no response. Mother, there's no food left. Mother pulled away. Parvana started to shake her again. Leave her alone, Noria yanked her away. Can't you see she's depressed? We're all depressed, Parvana replied. We're all so hungry. She wanted to shout, but she didn't want to frighten the little ones. She could glare, though, and she and Noria glared at each other for hours. No one ate that day. We're out of food, Noria said again to Parvana the next day. I'm not going out there. You have to go. There's no one else who can go. My feet are still sore. Your feet will survive, but we won't if you don't get us food. Now move. Parvana looked at Mother, still lying on the toe shack. She looked at Ali, worn out from being hungry and needing his parents. She looked at Miriam, whose cheeks were already beginning to look hollow and who hadn't been in the sunshine in such a long time. Finally, she looked at her big sister, Noria. Noria looked terrified. If Parvana didn't obey her, she would have to go for food herself. Now I've got her, Parvana thought. I can make her as miserable as she makes me. But she was surprised to find that this thought gave her no pleasure. Maybe she was too tired and too hungry. Instead of turning her back, she took the money from her sister's hand. What should I buy? She asked. And that's the end of chapter four of The Breadwinner.